Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Werner. I'm an executive uh, committee member with the Georgetown Wargaming. And today it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this event and to introduce our speakers, Lauren and Louise. Um, first, we have Lauren Sukin. Uh, she is a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Uh, she focuses on international security and with the, particularly the role of nuclear weapons in international politics. And our second speaker, Luis Rodriguez, who is a uh, Stanton Nuclear Postdoctoral Fellow uh, at the Center for International Security and Cooperation, also at Stanford. Um, he holds a PhD from the Department of Political Science at Johns Hopkins, and his research focuses on how the global South builds and maintains limits on the use of force in international law and organization. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to uh, our speakers. And um, if you all have any questions, please type them in the chat. They will address them at the end of their speech. Uh, you guys can go on ahead. Perfect. Thanks for the intro, Nick. Uh, thank you also for the opportunity to talk to you today. We're very excited about sharing some of our thoughts on how to use commercial board games into the IR classroom. And it's particularly interesting to be presenting over Zoom, especially because I think that the pandemic made us think of new ways of teaching and especially ways of interacting with other students in a way that is going to make them more engaged into what we're teaching. So hopefully we will give you a strategy that you folks can use in your classrooms later on. Okay, so today we're going to start by explaining some of the premises and the pitfalls of using board games in the IR classroom. We will explore simple IR concepts, especially when we use what we're calling commercial off the shelf or CODS games. And we will examine more niche CODS games for historical learning, especially when we use complex scenario building. So the first question is why are we using COD games? And there are two main reasons. The first one is that we can use these games as examples. Uh, especially when you are teaching international relations, you need to think of what kind of people are going to be in your classroom. And you cannot assume that everyone is going to have the same baseline knowledge. And with this kind of games, you can assess what knowledge your students are going to be coming in. And you can also give students these different concepts that they can then explore on their own without feeling that they need to express that they are not understanding something, especially if you were teaching a freshman class. And finally, it also gives them some tools that they can use to study on their own. Games can also help students explore the different IR concepts that they're gonna be learning in the freshman uh, classroom. Um, the first point is that COTS give students the opportunity to delve into a concept on their own, especially when they are not in the classroom, when they don't wanna to come to office hours, you are giving them a tool that then they can use on their own to explore the different concepts, the different theories that we are teaching in the classrooms. It also helps students visualize and draw connections between all these different concepts and historical components that we're bringing them in the classroom. Um, Cuts also help the students learn in a more immersive way. Instead of just listening to what the professor is saying or what the TA is saying, they can actually take these concepts home and use them in these different games. And of course, uh, COTS also generate a fun way of learning and generate excitement about these course materials. Now, uh, Codes are not the only example or are not the only pedagogical tool that you can use when you are teaching IR, especially in these freshman classes. I think it's very common also to use specialized simulations. And these are two similar strategies or pedagogical tools that you can use, but they are also different. So let us explain a little bit of those differences. The first one is that codes are less expensive. And Think about expenses, not only in terms of how much money you're going to be investing, but also in terms of the time and the people that you need to organize these different games. It's much easier to just bring a board game into the classroom or to help the students get these board games instead of just spending time and resources into organizing these different simulations. The second point is that CODs are also much more easier to repeat. Uh, simulations tend to be a one-off event, something that you do 
during a special date in your semester, whereas using board games or using CODs is much more easy to repeat over the course of the semester. So you can play one game throughout the semester to have the students it, use the different concepts that they are learning, or you can even bring different games instead of just having one event in the middle or at the end of the semester. CODs also help you simplify and illustrate concepts. It's much easier if you teach, for example, if you're talking about realism, if you teach uh, about the national interest, then use that specific concept, play in a game like Catan or Risk or Diplomacy, and then illustrate just that specific concept and help the student um, understand that concept better. Simulations, in contrast, help the students realize how to implement those concepts that they are learning into real world scenario and use all of these different concepts and all of those different skills at once. So the difference here is that with CODs, you specialize on one concept or one ability. And with simulations, you help them use all these different toolkits that you give students in just one real world scenario. And finally, CODs are designed to be fun on their own, uh, especially all of those uh, very commercial and very famous games are designed for people to enjoy playing them. And these not the simulations are not, but simulations have a more pedagogical uh, forefront um, goal or aim, whereas CODs are intended to help people have a good time. So there's a, a difference there between these two uh, different ways of using these different tools in the classroom. Now, when you, you're, when you use CODs that are uh, what we call the four eyes, the first one is the CODs are interactive. With those games, you are basically giving students a way to have hands-on experience with those concepts. You are giving students tools, especially when you think of concepts as tools, you're giving students tools that then they can use on their own to interact and play with those different concepts that you're giving them. The second point is that CODs are also integrated. You help the students, one, reflect on their concepts on their own, but two, you're also building these different connections in the group and you are helping the students uh, be in a more collaborative environment that otherwise they would have if you just teach at them. In this way, you also help the students help each other learn. So in that way, it's much more uh, interactive and integrated in the same way. Codes are also illustrative. They offer an example that the students will be able to then use later on. It's not the same to just give them an example from a historical case than to give them a board game in which they're gonna be able to use a concept and then maybe remember what a strategy, what a specific concept they were using to play Catan that one time when they are taking an exam, for example. It's much easier to remember what you did in a board game than maybe the historical example that you were giving in class. And finally, uh, CODs are also based on imagination. It's very easy as professors to just give our students all of these different concepts, especially because we know their jargon. So we assume that the students are gonna be able to understand, pick the jargon up and use it in all of these different exams and tests that we're gonna have with them. CODs help the students actually imagine how those concepts work and also helps them see them how important they are when they are thinking about their next move when they are playing all of these different board games. So in that way, it helps them be or have a more personal approach to learning and a more personal approach also to remember those concepts. CODs also have some pitfalls and this put pitfalls are not cons per se. These are just elements that professors or instructors need to remember when they are using CODs in their classroom. The first one is that it is necessary to think how you're gonna evaluate if your students are actually learning the specific concept of the specific historical illustration that you want them to learn. And in this way, you need to assess or design a way to assess how your students are actually learning. It's not the same to just give them the board game expecting that they're gonna be playing on their own than actually design on a strategy by which you will know if they are learning what you want them to learn. The second point is that 
Cards have different dream time. They are more complicated some than others. So you need to pay attention to what rules are there or the uh, accessibility levels for those students. You also need to learn how you are going to use a different context in terms of theory and in terms of uh, also historical context that your students will have. You cannot assume that all your students will have the same uh, baseline in terms of understanding a historical case or understanding the concepts. You need to be able to uh, help them uh, learn as they go. And in that way, you also need to understand how they're going to learn about these different rules, at, when mo at which moments in the classroom you're going to help them learn about these rules, and how you will assess, then again, how they are learning the different concepts that you want them to. These are just some quotes that uh, Lauren has gotten uh, in the evaluations when she has used these different board games when she teaches. And what we see in the classroom it does, is that basically students find these games to be a better explanation of some of the different concepts and theories that they are learning. So uh, there are different ways in how you can use CODs. You can use them in terms of using card games, in terms of using board games, and there are also some online versions of those games. And we also understand that there are some uh, economic costs of using them, but you can also find some knockoffs of some of those uh, games. For example, Catan has its own knockoff, Diplomacy has its own. Um, in terms of learning the rules, there are different ways that you can teach your students about these rules. You can either have them learn them in the classroom, you can ask them to learn them before, or there are even some tutorials and videos that you can ask your students to pre-watch before coming to class so that they can know the rules and get going. Uh, if you're gonna have them learn the rules in your class, then again, pay attention to actually giving them the time to learn it. And don't assume that all your students know how to play in these games, even if they are the most famous or the most popular. So um, let's start with, some elements now. Um, so we're going to start by talking a little bit as an aside about games that are not quite uh, commercial games, um, but are sort of modifications or games that you might be able to use in the classroom um, for other uh, reasons. So one of these is probably the way that we mostly use games in the classroom, which is teaching game theory. And I want to reiterate here that it can be helpful to have game theoretic models you know, laid out in a slide when you're teaching international relations, but this is an easy way to get students integrated into your class and to have an activity that's more interactive. So we have here a couple of the models that are very simple to have students play um, when they're in the classroom. Um, and these models can be easier to understand as a player than as equations, especially for intro level students, which is kind of what we're aiming some of these activities at. Um, we're gonna give you a couple of tips on how you can do that in the classroom. Um, so one way is to visualize a game tree or game dynamics in the lecture slides, and then have students play out the rules. Um, I like to get uh, poker chips or, can or candy um, to give to students at the beginning of a class that they can then use to trade back and forth. Even that sort of small token can make students more invested in a game and make decisions uh, with more strategic uh, concepts in mind. Um, and if you have smaller classes or you have an online learning environment, here are a couple of websites um, that give uh, students an opportunity to simulate game theoretic games, especially games that are connected to economic theories um, online. So we are also thinking of using CODs in a non-commercial way. So you can even take some of the main components or some of the base line elements of these games and then design your own ways so that you can adapt these games to the specific concepts or theories that you're going to be teaching. So for example, you can use something like chronology to then decide uh, different timelines that then you can help your students memorize in a better way. You can also use something like Jeopardy to help them learn also dates, but also different concepts. It's the same with uh, something like Taboo or Pictionary where you create a list of terms and concepts and then this will help the students learn or actually be able to connect the meaning with the concept in a more interactive way. And finally, you have something like code names, which will also help the students find the similarities between either 
IR authors or different IR concepts or strategies. So in this way, what we're trying to say is that you don't need to use the board games that are out there, but you can also take some of the uh, elements or the spirits of these different uh, cause and then adapt them to your specific classroom. Now we're gonna move on and talk about some common commercial games, um, which everyone is here for, right? Some tips and strategies for how you can beat your friends, but also how you can use these games in the classroom. And we're gonna talk both about some concepts from international political economy and some concepts from security studies. We'll wrap up by talking about more complex games, uh, more complicated war games or historical games, and then a couple of conclusions about how you can use these as tools in the classroom. So we're gonna start with Catan, which is a favorite. Uh, Catan is a hex based board where uh, players collect resources and build uh, settlements and roads in order to advance the game. We're gonna start with a quick refresh of the rules here. So players begin with settlements and roads on the hex nodes and edges uh, respectively. They uh, sequentially roll dice and then collect resources from hexes that are adjacent to where they built settlements when the number of the hexes rolled. Players then use those resources to build um, settlements, cities, roads, and to collect development cards, which we won't talk about today, um, and win by um, these constructions, so by building settlements and upgrading settlements to cities. We're also gonna talk about one other feature of the rules, which is the robber. Um, if you roll a seven, the most common dice roll, then you can steal a resource from another player and you can block production on one of the hexes in the games. So Catan is fundamentally a game about trade. It asks players to trade their resources with each other in order to advance their deck and then use that uh, to build um, and to uh, earn points. So you might ask students who play this game to think about comparative advantage and the conditions under which trade is beneficial. Players should try to trade to get scarce resources and focus on resources that they're more likely to collect. Um, trade looks different if you think about a comparative or absolute advantage uh, or relative or absolute advantage. At the beginning of the game, um, players are more likely to trade. You would need to get ahead and to collect resources. Towards the end of the game, when players start paying attention to the relative advantage aspect of the game and start trying to compete to win, you're less likely to see trade. We might ask students why these dynamics are happening and to think about how that applies to the different theories of trade that they may have learned in your classroom. Yutan also gives us an example of a commitment problem. It's hard to make trades that involve promises of future action, of promising future resources that you might collect on another role. You might ask students why this is. Well, there's no enforcement mechanism in the game of Catan. You can threaten future actions, but that's not always reliable. So it gives us a way of thinking about how the repeated dynamics of the game are what shape player behavior and make reputations very important for the core dynamic of trading. We can also use Catan to think about something like most favored nation status. So should you strike a deal with another player on the board uh, to trade your goods at lower costs with each other? Should you form some sort of alliance in Catan? Now, the best outcome for everyone at the table is if these alliances don't happen and everyone is able to trade with each other. But these types of institutions or these types of deals could help two underdogs catch up. So this gives us a way of thinking about why we see these dynamics play out and how we see these dynamics play out on a global stage. Catan also lacks institutions. And you might ask your students to think about what types of rules or institutions would make trade easier or more efficient. What would happen if there were rules that prevented um, giving one other player a most favored nation status, or if there was an institution that set global prices? We can also use Catan to think about broader IR theories. Um, we can think about it as an example of realism because everyone in the game is in competition. So one strategy is a version of offensive re realism where you should try to constantly expand and block other players' options. You could also think of a strategy that is based on a more defensive version of realism, where players instead try to protect their resources and expand within their own area. Um, and that in some ways might be um, a better or a different strategy depending on the approaches that other players are taking on the board. We can think of Catan from a liberal perspective as well. You could argue that whether or not um, a game is focused on competition or cooperation depends on the assumptions that everyone brings to the table. Maybe the game works better if everyone cooperates and trades, um, but the incentives of the game are generally to treat the world as one of relative advantage. 
From a constructivist perspective, you might ask students to think about the norms that players bring to the table and how they shape gameplay. Um, ideas about, for example, what is fair might determine player behavior. If you've ever played the online version of Catan, you might have noticed that there is a special rule um, that allows you to prevent other players from using the robber to target anyone who hasn't scored three points. This institutionalizes a norm about what's fair, about not targeting people at the beginning of the game or not targeting people who have a disadvantage. And we might think about where these ideas come from and how they might constrain the game. We can also think about Catan from the perspective of the behavioral revolution, the biases and assumptions that players are bringing to the board. Players might play based on their personal um, attitudes. They might use the robber to enact revenge rather than to do something we might think of as more rational, like target whoever is winning. We can also use the robber as a quick illustration of a prisoner's dilemma. Um, the values here assume that all uh, resources are worth one and uh, that the robber will only be placed one more time in the game. So these are approximate, but it's to give you a sense of what the payoffs look like based on whether you choose to put the robber on a square where no one is uh, producing, like the desert square, or to put the robber on a square where you're able to steal resources and block production. Now, it's hard to agree not to use the robber in the game to attack other players. And again, it's better for everyone if there's always competition, but players get to steal a card if they attack. And this creates the incentives that mean that for most of the game, um, players use the robber relatively aggressively. You could solve this problem with side payments. You could bribe the person who's moving the robber. You could use a tit for tat strategy by threatening retaliation or a grim trigger strategy. Um, and you can use this example to help students think about how they might solve this type of dilemma um, on a small scale and then generalize it to more uh, broader international phenomenon. We can also ask students to think about modifications. What happens if we're trying to make a decision about moving the robber earlier in the game or in a game with more players? Um, and then that's, this allows students to think through uh, these other variations of this model. It also gives us a way of talking about the offense-defense dilemma. The game privileges defense and settlements can't be uh, destroyed, but it has a distinguishability problem. It's hard to tell if you're moving the robber to resume your own production or you're moving the robber in order to steal from another player whose progress you want to block. We can use games to help students move into a more macroscopic perspective. One way to do this would be to ask players to think beyond the constraints of the game and imagine how new factors or new actors would change behavior. And this can help students draw connections between different ideas and examples. For example, we might want to ask students to think about what would happen if there were military forces in the game or if students could import items that can't be created domestically. We can also think about games from more critical perspectives. Um, for example, students might be encouraged to think about core limitations of games where they only offer one perspective and they have to simplify or remove some factors and some actors from various scenarios. In the case of Catan, we might understand this to be fundamentally a game about colonization and resources extraction. So students could be encouraged to think about how the game would look different if it were built from a fundamentally different perspective. Now we're gonna talk about some examples of games that could be used to illustrate simple concepts in security studies. And we're gonna start with one of my favorite games, which is a game called Root. Uh, Root is a simple battle game with different um, uh, centers and roads that connect to those different centers. And this game can illustrate a number of different features of international relations. The game centers around taking and holding territory and each player plays as a different character with a different society. Each player therefore has different capabilities, uh, win conditions and different leadership styles that shape their behavior in the game. This makes Root interesting because it's an asymmetric game design. So players advance at different rates and have to account for that in their strategy. Um, we're gonna go through a number of different potential players in the game and talk about some of the features of these players and illustrate how these features might be connected to different principles in international relations. So we'll start um, with cats and several characters or characteristics of the cat um, can reflect different features in military policy. The cats are a monarchic society, which means they have a castle that they have to protect. They're also the dominant state force, so their military is spread out across the board at the beginning of the game. They have a defensive advantage, so if they consolidate their numerous warriors into defensible territory, that helps their strategy. And 
Um, offensively, they need to focus on superiority. Their um, incentives are structured so that they should generally only attack invading forces if they have an advantage, and so that they need to avoid military overstretch. Um, the cats also give us a way of thinking about civil war. There are forces that represent a rebellion or insurgency, and the cats have a strong incentive to stop them early if that's possible. So students might think about how these different features of uh, the way the cat's gameplay is shaped match up or don't match up with the historical reality and the theoretical reality of military policy. We can use the bird player in the game to think about the intersection of domestic politics and international relations. Birds earn points by holding territory and by destroying buildings. The birds are an autocratic society and the actions that the player can take in the game are limited by a decree of a ruler, a decree that often forces aggression and expansion, as some have argued can often be the case in autocratic societies. They also model audience costs. Leaders of the birds are overthrown and replaced if the decree is not fulfilled. And they uh, are incentivized towards repression and also have to quickly repress insurgent forces. The Alliance is the primary insurgent character in the game. Rather than being modeled as a state military, it represents a looser collective of forest dwellers that are united around a shared populist ideology. The Alliance has both civilian and military actors, which gives us a way of thinking about some of the intersections um, between uh, civil military uh, act actors um, and other state militaries. They earn their points from spreading sympathy throughout the board and are designed for subversion. They only have a small number of military forces, but can effectively expand nevertheless. Um, they have an interesting feature around their recruitment where state players or bigger sort of military players that move through their territory or destroy defenseless civilian sympathizers cause outrage and aid the recruitment of the insurgency, uh, which suggests to me the game designer here probably read quite a bit of political science before designing this feature of the game. They also have a commitment problem. It could be advantageous for them to have allies in the short term because they're fighting an asymmetric conflict, but their win condition requires essentially board-wide expansion, so they eventually have to renege on their alliances. In addition to an insurgency, the Crows represent a different type of violent non-state actor, a terrorist organization. Um, they have less local sympathy than the Alliance, but still have some local ties. They have what the game calls embedded agents that protect their plots, things like bombs and extortion, which can be revealed and leveraged against the more powerful state military type forces in the game. They're a highly asymmetric player. Um, and even uh, relatively unprotected plots can be quite effective against adversary forces, but there's a trade-off. Um, it's much easier to antagonize players than it is to win. The game is designed so that these actors um, generally have to fight in at least some battles against military forces to win, but it's very difficult to gather the forces to do that. We might also think that this reflects much of the empirical reality when we're thinking about conflicts between state and non-state actors. Now, the last character we're going to talk about here is the Vagabond character, which essentially faces a small state dilemma. It earns points for moving around the board and aiding players to build alliances. It has to balance. It has to choose between whether it's going to bandwagon with the bigger players like the cats and the birds, or whether or not it's going to engage in power balancing and develop an alliance with one of the more asymmetric players um, like the Alliance or the Crows. It also represents two um, dangerous features of alliances or, or two uh, risks of alliances. One of these is entanglement because some of these players have the ability to forcibly instigate conflict between other players. And another is entrapment. Uh, once the character develops a sufficiently strong alliance, it can move the other team's um, allied warriors along the board. Um, this is a risk that we talk about when we think about alliance politics. Um, once allies are strongly connected, they often have to come to the other's aid, even if that wouldn't necessarily be strategic for them absent the alliance. So if we want to apply a more critical perspective and think more broadly about the implications of this game, we might think about just war principles of jus and bello, or the moral rules of engagement for warfare. Now, one of these principles, the principle of distinction, argues that militaries should only uh, target uh, combatants and not civilians. The outrage principle where um, attacking the civilian members of the Alliance team leads to more recruitment for the Alliance or the insurgency might give us a way of thinking about the implications of this principle. The principle of proportionality um, tells us 
that uh, militaries should uh, target um, objects that help further um, military uh, goals and should respond proportionally um, to attacks. But the game forces players to destroy civilian objects, meaning that this principle doesn't get reflected very well in the game. The principle of military necessity um, also is not well reflected in the game because players are incentivized to repress the alliance or the vagabond, um, which arguably are civilian uh, type characters. But the game does represent the principle of limitation, the idea that uh, certain types of, um, of tactics uh, can't be used or should not be used in warfare. And it does this with a card it calls the brutal tactics card, which gives an advantage to the attacker for using these banned tactics, um, but also gives a reward to the defender um, in the form of a point um, and tries to um, exemplify some of the problems with these types of tactics, though, uh, albeit in a very simplified way. Um, there's also the principle of humane treatment, which applies to things like prisoners of war, um, treating the, the adversary combatants um, in uh, humane ways. And uh, you could argue that this is modeled by a feature of the game where injured enemy soldiers are returned back to that uh, state, at least in, in, uh, for the cat uh, military. All right, so we're now going to talk about diplomacy which is an, a more classic board game. It's sort of a risk style board game that's all about territorial expansion. You play diplomacy as one of the great powers of Europe in 1901, the United Kingdom, France, Austria, Germany, Italy, Russia, or the Ottoman Empire. Players move armies and fleets, support allied units, or hold their positions, and the battles are determined by superior force rather than a dice roll. Um, each turn of the game involves a number of different steps. Players conduct diplomacy with each other, write orders, resolve them all at once, then retreat or disband um, as the resolution of the orders requires, and then gain or lose units every other turn. Um, diplomacy is a very complicated game and I think reflects quite a number of principles of international relations. We're only going to focus a couple or on a couple of those um, for now. So the first feature that we wanna focus on is how diplomacy represents some level of realism in military strategy. Um, one way in which it does this is by confining um, different forces to different domains. The armies and navies have to respectively stay on land or in water, although ships can be used to convoy armies. The game also does a good job of modeling the dynamics of things like transportation and supply routes. Um, you can only move to or support forces in adjacent territory and have to take account of the different pathways that you might be able to use to move um, from one location to another. Games often simplify away these dynamics. It also uh, forces players to think about industrialization or industrial capabilities because the size of each player's force depends on the number of supply centers uh, that are controlled. Um, in this game, that essentially means major cities. Um, and uh, players also have to think about resource constraints more broadly. So forces can only serve one goal at a time and intended actions can be stopped or disrupted uh, by actions of other players. Um, in this way, for a relatively simple and common commercial game, diplomacy does a fairly good job of modeling some of the critical dynamics that militaries have to think about as they're designing and implementing strategy. But most importantly, diplomacy gives us a way of thinking about alliance politics and negotiations. Um, in this first stage of any turn, um, players develop their strategy in what's called the diplomacy phase. They uh, converse with all other players or in private groups to try to decide what actions they're going to take. Everything that's said in this stage is non-binding, but the repeated interactions in the game are again critical for shaping player behavior. These alliances are key. Winning the game in isolation is nearly impossible, so diplomacy um, is a very important part of diplomacy of the game. The strategy that players take is shaped by geostrategic factors that we often argue take precedence in international relations. Things like the geography of the board, military resources and capabilities, um, and to some degree economic resources as well, as we talked about. Um, players can um, try to leverage these capabilities by making threats to deter or coerce, or they can use alliances to try to join capabilities together. But the fact that, that players have to work in collaboration means that many of the elements that we think about in international relations is critical, like private information, incentives to misrepresent, bluffing, persuasion, and reputation, all play a very important role in the game. 
Now, um, one tip that uh, I'll give everyone here is when you're in the diplomacy phase, it's really important to think about what the other player's goals are, whether that's controlling strategic territory, expanding their territory, defending um, areas they already control, or maybe even something like enacting revenge. The different goals and strategies of the players can be understood by our different theories of politics. And you should ask students to think about what would happen if they played the game according to different IR principles, and to try to think about the principles that are defining the behavior of the other students that are in their group. I um, was hoping to uh, do a quick exercise, but I don't think we'll have time for that now. Um, this is a screenshot from Backstabber, which is a, a sort of free version of diplomacy for anyone who might be interested in trying this another time. Um, we talked about Jus and Bello or the morality of war fighting with Root, and now we're going to talk about Jus ad Bellum or the morality of conflict initiation in diplomacy. So these rules suggest that war has to be a military necessity, a last resort, a proportional response, likely to succeed and intended for as short of a time as possible. Um, you might ask students to think about whether they follow these principles and why these principles might be advantageous, even if they aren't necessarily mandated by the specific rules of the game. Students should think about how these principles operate by reciprocity, enable strategic advantages in war fighting, and to think about whether and how these rules might be able to constrain behavior, both in the game and more broadly in the real world. Now we're gonna move on to talk about some more complex games. We're gonna spend um, sort of a brief time illustrating uh, two different types of games that can be used for more in-depth learning. Um, and then uh, wrap up with some conclusions. So one game we're gonna talk about here is Memoir 44, one of the games that I think does a particularly good job of helping students think about military strategy. The board has um, a hex-based um, play and has 15 different battle scenarios that include beach landings, urban warfare, and countryside combat. This Scenarios include um, various battles involved in the D-Day operation, like the Pegasus Bridge operation, Omaha Beach Operation Cobra, and the liberation of Paris. The game also provides historical background for each battle, which makes it a particularly good learning tool because students can read about the historical context um, either before or after they play the game. The game mimics the historical train, the initial troop placements, and the objectives of each army in the battle. It even has special rules for each battle to make the train more realistic. For example, infantry can't shoot across the Rhine at the Arheim Bridge in the game because in reality, uh, the river is too wide at this point for the shooting to work. Um, and the game involves deploying different types of troops like infantry, paratroopers, tanks, artillery, and resistance fighters, and applying the unique skills of each unit type. It also requires smart navigation of the train in order to win. So this I think is a particularly good game for helping students understand some of the more tactical dynamics um, of military operations. There are a number of other war games that have many of these features, um, many of which uh, this group has talked about before. Um, and if you are new to the group, you can take a look at the YouTube page, uh, which has uh, several different sessions and lectures that talk about other war games that utilize some of these dynamics. One of my favorite historical games, another type of more complex uh, game that can be used in teaching is a game called Twilight Struggle, which sees the US and the Soviet Union compete across the world throughout the Cold War. They use coups, military operations, and political influence to try to sway various countries to their side. Throughout the game, players take actions using cards that depict real world events and try to mimic the effect of those events on international politics. For example, the Fidel Castro card removes US influence in Cuba. The NATO card prevents the Soviet Union uh, from taking military actions in US controlled European countries. The Marshall Plan card gives the US more influence um, in Western Europe, particularly in Western Europe that has uh, very little influence from the Soviet Union. So these cards not only depict real world events and instances, but also think critically about how these shaped international dynamics. And this makes it a particularly useful learning tool um, for students. The game operates uh, by having players earn points via influence in both battleground and non-battleground states, uh, which helps students figure out how to emphasize um, or think about the historical emphasis on um, certain regions and countries relative to others. 
Um, and it also models dynamics of alliances where the initial and strategic position of influence should take into account historical alliances because players have to think about what historical events might be coming next and might influence the pattern of play. The game also incorporates the space race, um, it incorporates DEF CON levels as DEF CON degrades, military actions become more limited and um, involves uh, critical dynamics about alliances as well. So I want to talk briefly about some of the pros and cons of these complex games. They offer comparisons to actual historical events um, and can be especially useful if they're paired with case studies. They provide in-depth and generally more accurate reflections of politics and military strategy than the simpler games, although they also um, can focus a little bit more narrowly on particular uh, historical cases. They often incorporate multiple aspects of international relations or multiple domains rather than testing only a few theories or dynamics. But the games do have some cons for use in the classroom. They can be time consuming to play and learn, although walkthroughs and tutorials can be very helpful for helping students overcome those barriers. They can be a bit harder to synthesize clear lessons for students, especially for first time players, because they're a bit less parsimonious and there's generally no dominant strategy, but they also offer some creativity and flexibility that the simpler games don't. And they require deep background knowledge, which makes the games particularly um, suited for classrooms where you might be focusing on a couple of historical events or a classroom that is taking a much more narrow approach to international relations rather than a broader sort of intro IR style class. So wrap up with some implications um, and by thinking about how we might engage um, students after they've played these games. Now, I like to ask students to write a memo to try to reflect on their experience using the board games and to try, try to draw connections with material in the class. But I wanna note that this is not the only way to have students um, assess their participation, particularly with a creative assignment like this. It could be useful to have students um, design and film walkthrough videos, maybe record a podcast, or even ask students to create a game or a modification of an existing game to help think about what the games would look like in other contexts or if they involved other uh, features um, or uh, other actors. So I'm gonna show here a couple of different post-reflection questions that might apply broadly across games, um, but we're not gonna talk about any of these in too much depth. So you might ask students to um, think about how the game relates to principles, concepts, and case studies of the class, to think about how principles and incentives shaped their in-game actions, to think about the assumptions the game makes about political behavior and political institutions, or what models of international relations describe the in-game world. Students might want to think about how well uh, the game does or does not accurately reflect politics and draw conclusions from their experience in the game to their experience um, or to, to broader experiences in real world politics. And importantly, students might also want to know how this misrepresents politics. All of these games are simplifications of strategy and simplifications of historical scenarios. So thinking about what would increase accuracy or what different modifications to the game would do can help students draw connections between theories and build out broader and deeper understanding of um, different international relations theories. And you might also ask students just to think about what the point of the assignment really is. How can we use simple models of politics and what are the limitations of those models? One challenge for political science relative to other disciplines like history is we're often making simplifications in order to understand and predict broader phenomenon and asking students to think about the implications of that and the, and the uh, advantages of that can help them understand uh, why uh, political science provides value in uh, reflecting on the world. So there are a couple of key takeaways that we want everyone to come up with today. Um, that's that interactive learning can be really important for helping students visualize concepts, generalize lessons, and apply knowledge from international political economy and security studies um, to the broader world. These games can be quite effective teaching and study tools, in part because they can generate enthusiasm among students. Um, they can be uh, helpful for integrating course concepts. Um, and for um, allowing students to engage with more creative and imaginative approaches.
These simple games can be used to illustrate a number of different IR concepts as we've shown today. And that's by no means the limitation of all of the things that we can illustrate and think about with um, these commercial off the shelf games. There are also many more specialized games that build historical knowledge or illustrate complex dynamics and things like military strategy or trade. So one thing that we would love everyone who came here today to do is to submit some suggestions for games or guidance for student players. We've created this Google form that we're also going to post a link to in the chat. And we're gonna host a repository of games and resources on my website, um, which hopefully will give you all um, a set of games that we think reflect important principles in international relations and could be useful for instructors um, in IR courses. So I'll pause for a second if anyone wants to take down um, this link here. And again, we'll add this in the chat. Okay. Um, we have a couple of game suggestions that we've collected already um, and want to point out a couple of different topics that we think can be especially useful um, for those who may want to use these games in a classroom setting. We have a number of different military strategy and war games that we've suggested, as well as sort of a subset of these games that focus on insurgency or governance issues. There are fewer games on trade and economy in a political sense, but there are um, a number of them, which we've listed here, that try to incorporate trade dynamics into models of politics. There are also diplomacy and negotiation games that give students a broader perspective on uh, how to um, integrate different theories of international relations into um, a grand strategy perspective. There are a couple of games, um, largely less focused on politics, but that do a good job of modeling dynamics related to incomplete information or bluffing, concepts that can often be a bit harder for students to understand the implications of, um, and a couple of cooperation games that can help students understand the different elements um, of cooperative models of international politics as well. And then we have some resources that we'll put up on my website as well. Um, some of the research on games in teaching and interactive learning um, that can be particularly helpful for getting started with this method if you want to use it in your teaching. So as we wrap up today, I want you all to think about what some of your favorite commercial off the shelf games are. Are these games that can illustrate different principles in international relations? If so, how accurately or inaccurately do they represent those principles? And to think about whether or not you would use these commercial off the shelf games in your teaching, and what do you think the advantages of that would be? Thank you, and we're looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to come and speak with us. We have a few questions that have been posted here in the chat, and I'm just going to uh, read them out so that uh, the people on the, that are watching the recording later uh, can get a sense of that. So uh, our first question for you all, um, coming from Amanda Rosen, uh, this comes back to a, uh, when you were talking about the advantages of, uh, of commercial games. Uh, she asks, uh, when you say that uh, Coates games are less expensive, less expensive than what? Um, she points to, in fact, the availability of uh, free non-commercial games, such as the Hobbes game, comparative politics game show, identity exercise. Yeah, um, so there are a lot of different resources for teaching interactively and in international relations. Um, we mean expense both in a monetary sense and also um, as compared to some of the more elaborate exercises that um, professors and other um, instructors might use when they're trying to develop a more integrated um, and uh, immersive classroom experience. So these games can often be less expensive than the cost of, for example, running a large scale simulation or purchasing um, the sort of complex scenario building games that we talked about. We certainly don't mean to say that there aren't um, many free different resources out there. And we hope to put a number of those um, in the repository that we'll be collecting on the website as well. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, it's also less expensive in terms of attention. I think that something that the pandemic has uh, taught us as IR scholars and teachers is that we are competing for the attention of other students. And in a way, it's easier for a student to just focus on 
a board game for an hour, an hour and a half, instead of doing all the preparation that takes in order for something like, I don't know, a, a simulation or um, war gaming in the, the more general sense. So it's less expensive in terms of, yeah, resources, but also in terms of the attention that the students will bring into these games. Yeah, we also have a, another question from Amanda. Um, can you speak to how you use Twilight Struggle in a classroom, um, given that it's a two player game that takes about two hours to even learn? Uh, she has found it uh, very limiting from both a cost and a time perspective and would welcome advice on using it in the classroom. Yeah, so we have two pieces of advice here. One is Twilight Struggle, like many of the other slightly more complex games are easier to play in their online form than in the traditional board game form. That's because the programming around that limits your moves and lets you easily refer back to the instructions for the game. So it lowers the burden um, of sort of time that it takes to learn the rules of the game because students can play through a tutorial um, and makes it so that players don't have to sort of constantly flip back and forth between the rules and gameplay. Um, the other way that I've used Twilight Struggle, I think one way to do this is to give students a choice of different games to play, allow them to sort of take the games home and play on their own time. That lets students choose um, sort of the intensity of game that they're interested in and then reflect on the game afterwards. So with something like Twilight Struggle or a much sort of more complicated, more time consuming game, it is important to recognize that that's a potential limitation. I think that it is also important to think what is the goal of playing the game. The goal, remember, is not to finish the game or to win the game in itself. So you need to think of what is that pedagogical takeaway that you want your students to learn. And that you might accomplish in one, two turns. It's the same with other simulations. Maybe if you're simulating how to negotiate the MPT uh, in terms of like the RevCons, for example, the goal is not to finish the RevCon conference. The goal is just to have your students think about the specific preferences of countries. So what you have to do is have those goals, very, like bury those uh, goals and aims in mind when you are designing those games. Thank you. Uh, Chris Hunt asks, um, although gaming has been very critical for his own development of an understanding of IR and strategy, it can be tough to fit into the classroom uh, as more the, than a one or a two time thing. Do you have an experience or suggestions at encouraging student gaming outside of the classroom as homework uh, in say a flipped gaming classroom model? Yeah, so one of the things that we think of as a nice advantage of commercial off the shelf games is that if students play these games and realize how fun they are, some students are going to continue to play them for much more than just the classroom experience. So integrating these games into the classroom in the first place and encouraging students by simply um, asking them to play the games later on um, or making the games available, I'll let students borrow games for the duration of the quarter that I'm teaching um, will give students an opportunity to play the games later and find games that they're excited about. Um, the iterative or the, the iterative nature of these games can be helpful for helping students think through strategy and develop it over time. But you're right that um, it would be, I think, quite difficult to have students repeatedly play games throughout um, a course unless you're sort of focusing on one particular area and you find a game that you think is, is especially useful for that. So uh, we have Colin Darlington who asks, uh, what differences in engagement uh, slash reflection do you see between experienced students, such as ones that are already employed in government, industry, elsewhere, and new newcomer students? Yeah, so um, this presentation was mostly focused on newcomer students of thinking about these games for a course like Introduction to International Relations. That's been my experience teaching. Um, I have mostly used these games in a context with relatively beginner students. Um, so I'm not sure that I can speak to this necessarily. I would expect though for players' strategies to be different. As you play these games, you learn sort of the tricks and strategies. But I think often players don't take time to think about where those strategies are coming from and what the theoretical underpinnings of them are. If you have more experienced students, I think that's great. And you have the opportunity to maybe have them play a game that's more complicated or that um, incorporates lots of different dynamics um, and might, they might be able to uh, more quickly reflect on how the strategies that they've adopted for their own use um, can 
um, have some more theoretical grounding in some of the, the principles that you might talk about in an international relations course. I think that it's also important to think of experience or levels of experience in terms of playing the games. It's not the same to have uh, a group of people where everyone else got to play Catan and may, then maybe they will just want to win the game instead of having a group that is just learning how to play Catan and is actually using the different concepts that you are bringing to the classroom. So think of those different levels of experience, not only in how people or how much people know about IR in general, but also how much they know how to play these specific games. Uh, Sean asks, um, any thoughts about the use of matrix games in a classroom setting? Uh, he is currently experimenting with having a game design a matrix game around the current Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, but he's curious about the experience of others. Yeah, I'm not sure that this is something that I, I can really speak to. Um, it sounds like a really interesting game and is definitely something that I'd love to learn more about if someone else who's on the call has used or designed one of these games and has some suggestions. Um, would love to have you uh, maybe post that in the chat um, or we could uh, discuss that, that more briefly. Uh, Daniel uh, Tinto, he asks, uh, can you post the repository link again? And would it be possible that the slides uh, be made available after the presentation? Yeah. Um, you are uh, posting the recording on YouTube. Yes, so the recording will be available. Um, we're gonna put the repository on my website, which is uh, laurensukin.com. Um, I've just put that in the chat um, and I'm happy to put the slides there as well. Um, so I will uh, take note of that. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, I have another question from Colin. Uh, he asks, how well do you find the use of uh, COTS games for uh, trialing grand strategy options? That is, how easy to change the means between runs? Uh... Um, yeah, so I think this is, um, an important aspect of lots of different commercial off the shelf games. A lot of them do try to model um, grand strategy more generally, um, but it's very difficult to do that in a way that's sufficiently complex, right? I think a lot of the games that are useful teaching tools focus on a particular um, dynamic rather than incorporating a lot of them. Uh, we talked about diplomacy in part because I think this is one game where every different iteration can look very different depending on the strategies that players um, adopt from the beginning. Um, so I think it's a question of sort of picking a game that works with the material you've taught in the classroom and trying to encourage students um, to be very deliberate about the strategies that they take. Um, I hope that that sort of helps there, I think it's a little bit difficult to talk about this um, generally because a lot of these games are quite different. Yeah. I think that it also helps if you are thinking of using these games as tools and not as ends. So I always use Katana as an example because I think it's very flexible to teach IR. If you have your students thinking about, for example, what their main uh, goal at the end is going to be and changing those goals in the different iterations of the game might help help them think about like what specific means they might use. So you can say that the mean, that the specific goal is not to win the game, but to make everyone lose. Then you can see how students might choose different means or different strategies to achieve that. So then again, don't, um, don't think that you have to follow all the rules in those games. You can also think creatively about how to adapt the game that you're using for the specific lesson that you're teaching. Thank you. Um, we have, uh... Angela Ray, who asks, um, from the feedback you've received from students, uh, which one of the games that you mentioned or maybe didn't mention have they identified as being the most engaging? Yeah, so um, perhaps surprisingly, I think students really like the complex games when they've had the time to really delve into them. I've had students get really excited about Twilight Struggle, even very beginner students, um, and you know, play that game repeatedly. Um, Memoir 44, I think, also is a favorite. Um, Diplomacy, while I think is a great game, um, is a game that really depends on the set of players. So sometimes I've had students really love that game, and other times I've had students um, not be as excited about it. Um, 
then I think uh, there are a lot of sort of variation in um, what students are looking for in these games. Um, so things like Twilight Imperium sometimes is very exciting to students who are much more interested in sort of grand strategy and these broader dynamics. Um, but I'll also have students who really love the battlefield um, dynamics and are excited about games that focus on tactics. Um, so I would say the, the list of games that we um, put up on the slide, although it does include quite a lot of games, is curated to games where either you know, we've played them and think they fit well in a classroom where they've been trialed in classrooms um, and uh, received positive student feedback. I think that it also depends a lot on the classroom that you have. Uh, so I have had classrooms that are very competitive and then they really like something like risk or diplomacy. But I have also had classrooms that are more collaborative and, and that are more into cooperative games. And then they like something like Agricola, for example, where you just change a little bit of the rules so they can actually use some of the IR concepts. So the, I guess that the, the um, strategy there is to understand what kind of audience you have and then pick the right uh, cuts for them. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tim Mensch uh, asks, uh, games often reflect Western thought. Do you have uh, know any games that reflect maybe an alternative view or a non-Western perspective? Um, I'm certainly not the expert on this, so I um, am not sure that there are um, particular games that I want to suggest. I would say, though, that I think it's important when you are playing these games to recognize the intellectual tradition that the games come from. We talked about that a little bit in the presentation, um, but I think it can be helpful for students to think about who in a game has agency or doesn't have agency and what sort of scenario the game is trying to depict and why. Um, questioning the assumptions that the game designers have made, I think is an especially useful exercise for students and something that uh, is kind of accessible to everyone and they can get excited about. All of these games are simplifications, so students at all levels are able to recognize some of the ways in which games might simplify reality. Um, and I think one, as you point out, common way to do that is to design a game from a very Western perspective. Um, I wish I had great suggestions on games with alternative views, um, but we'll definitely look into that uh, for the repository. And if anyone does have suggestions and wants to put them into that uh, Google form that we sent around, we would love to get your feedback on that. I think that um, it's also important as the facilitators of those um, different games when you're using their classroom to make your students question those assumptions. So it's not the same to just uh, play Catan and then make them expand and try to win, that if you actually ask your students to reflect on why they are doing that and what kind of uh, different concepts or assumptions are they using from higher theories that might also have a Western bias. So I see the point about those games having this Western bias, but it's something that also IR scholarship has. So use them, we use these games also to have your students question those bias even in the discipline. Great answer. Um, we have Marshall Miller who asks, um, ideally, should all students play the same games or is it okay to have groups of students playing different games like at the same time? I think both models here um, work. And again, it's going to depend on the classroom. If you have a classroom that's, for example, focused on military tactics and strategy, you might wanna have students play the same game and compare their results. Or for a very historically based game, something like Memoir 44, you can even have students then take a look at the actual military actions that happened in the battle and compare their gameplay um, to the course of the conflict that the game is trying to simulate. For a broader class, something like an introductory level class, I think it's helpful to have students play different games. Um, students can then write these uh, assignments or uh, as we talked about, maybe they record videos or podcasts or take a more sort of creative approach to thinking about how the games connect to in-class material. Um, if you then make those accessible to lots of different students and allow them to borrow games and play them on their own time, it can give them a way of uh, sort of getting a, a more broad sense of how different games and game dynamics reflect on um, the different sort of theories and ideas that you might talk about in a classroom. Um, also, it depends, I think, whether or not you're playing games in the class or you're having students take the games home. Uh, remember that a lot of these games have vastly different um, time commitments. 
So if you are going to play games in the classroom, then I would really advise you to think about how long each of the games are going to take. Um, and you know, don't maybe pair a very uh, time consuming game like diplomacy with a really short game uh, like Catan. Yeah. I think that it's also important to think about what you want to do with those games. So if you just want your students to use the different concepts that they are learning in like an IR one of one kind of class, then maybe if they do have the resources and the time, do have them play different games and then just share them and teach each other how to play them. But if you want them to understand how different resources, different goals change how someone plays a game, then maybe have the same one and change just some specific rules or goals in how different teams play it. It's something similar to what happens in some simulations about escalation, for example. If you change the specific resources that one team has or the specific goals that one team has, it's also interesting to see how different strategies teams come up with. So you might do something similar by playing uh, the same game in different teams, just changing, um, changing little things and see how those changes affect how people play those games. Uh, we have one last question uh, from John Pett. Can you recommend any board game that would uh, help students to understand the spectrum between rational actor assumptions and just mad, bad, sad actors? Yeah, this is, I think, both an interesting and a very important question and a timely one. I think we're seeing a lot of writing about whether or not Putin, for example, is rational, bad, mad, or sad, um, all of which I think are, are possible options, certainly. Um, I think that the more sort of complex games that have a sort of grand strategy dynamic allow the players in the game to bring their own sort of biases um, and behavioral patterns to the game. So in a very structured game, um, something like uh, maybe Seven Wonders, it's hard for uh, players to kind of act out these different types of rational actor assumptions. Um, but in a more complex game, something like maybe uh, Pax Pamir or um, something like uh, Labyrinth, uh, which is a great game, but uh, very complicated for classroom use, uh, Diplomacy, Twilight Imperium, um, Pandemic, uh, these are all games that uh, maybe are a bit more time consuming and dynamic, but also allow um, a little bit more flexibility in player behavior, um, which allows students not just to think about the strategies that they're taking in the game, but to think critically about the strategies that other players are using and to try to investigate where those ideas are coming from um, and what's driving different players' behavior. And I think that also post game assessment activities might help with students reflect on what kind of emotions they brought to the game. So then again, I'm a fan of Katana, that is why I keep bringing Katana as an example. But you can ask someone when they were losing, why they decided to make everyone lose with them, for example. So you can ask them to reflect on these emotions to see if they were rational at the moment of making those decisions, or if they were using much more emotional decision making in the kind of strategies they were implementing. I think this is one sort of important advantage of the games is there's often a difference between our theoretical models of international relations and how states actually act in the real world. It can be difficult for introductory students to square these sort of simplistic theories um, that some work in international relations champions and the behavior that they observe um, when they're actually reading about politics. Games are kind of a bridge in between that. There's a lot of structure, but at the same time, it allows for these different behavioral um, functions and for different sort of norms and attitudes and understandings of the dynamics of the game to shape behavior. Um, so this is, you know, I think one feature that can make these games really suitable for beginner players or sort of beginner um, students who, who are just getting started with international uh, relations scholarship. Well, I think that is the last question that we had in the chat. We had a lot of animated discussion and rebuttals to your um, your various different points, um, and particularly some game suggestions like uh, particularly uh, Zendo and Spirit Island as examples of uh, non-Western perspectives. Um, so I encourage you all to look at those. But thank you so much for um, taking the time to share your thoughts on this issue with us. And um, just going to remind everybody, if you missed the part of it, um, we will be posting this later on uh, YouTube. But uh, thank you all very much. I'm gonna stop it right there.
and 